So first of all, good morning. Welcome back after your happy Chinese New Year's holiday. Today is March the 2nd, okay, 2015. And this is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. And if you look at the calendar and also the white screen of today, we are already in week number 7, okay, week number 7. So, week number seven means um, this is the beginning of the end of the second learning contract because by the end of this week, you would have finished your, the milestone of the second learning contract and by the end of this Saturday, and you can take it for granted, maybe it's on, also on Sunday, I will not count you late, that uh, you will have finished uh, submitting your artifacts for learning contract number two, which is for self-regulated learning, okay? And so this morning, uh, after yesterday, I've given you the teacher's message for week number seven. Uh, if you look at the teacher's message for week number seven, it's another reminder that these are the artifacts you need to submit, okay, as a pair or as a team, but mostly uh, the teamwork will be very much emphasized in the last learning contract. And so the only uh, experiment to help to one team in this second learning contract is next week when we're going to hear the individual team's digital story. Okay? So number item one, two, three, four, five, and six, as well as seven. Okay, seventh, you can put it off, or because you, you enjoy your Chinese studios home, they will help you to review it in the first learning contract. But the most important thing is to know that this is the important uh, milestone you need to give in order to help you learn to learn, all right? So as I begin today's class by emphasizing the difference between this class and the other class I teach, uh, it's that we do not have as many quizzes or homework in this class as in the other classes, which comes every week, like in the countless class, uh, and also quizzes every two weeks. In this class, the most important thing is to develop your ability to learn to learn, to manage your learning, to understand the milestones of work to be done at the end of each contract. And normally, each contract lasts from three weeks to four weeks, and I'm giving you four weeks time indeed. And so, uh, in the first learning contract, you learn inquiry-based learning. That means the way to ask proper questions and the way to carry out practical thinking through the OIA context, the observations, interpretations, and applications, a means of writing a journal, that means take notes, discussions with your learning partner, writing the report together, and finally come back to write the first of rock. Now, after finish grading your work in the first learning contract, I have emphasized in my grading, particularly in the rock, that you need to refocus on what is meant by writing a rock based on what you've done in the context of writing in general, in the context of discussions, and in the context of writing a report. But rock is a very important piece of your learning, which indicate how much you already master based on the topic you choose. Uh, when I look at your rock, uh, you understand what I've given you in the context of how you can position the writing. And hopefully you can improve on that in the second learning contract and also in the last learning contract. It's very important, okay? Uh, so, um, the idea here is to make sure, because we give, we've given you the freedom to choose a topic, and the freedom to stick to the topic in the context of the work, take notes, discussions, report, and your rock. It must be coherent and consistent. And so uh, the constructivist way to learn to learn is how are you going to maintain interest in the topic you choose from the very beginning to the very end when you submit something. Normally you have three to four weeks time to take a good look at the topic, okay, even though I understand through some of your sharings that you may not have a very good collaborations with your learning partner, but for a topic you choose, you have to stick to it and find enough information or examples to ensure that you can write something in your blog which would demonstrate that you have done some good study there, okay? So it's very important. 
And also in the second learning contract, we emphasize on how you manage achieving your goals. Okay, what do you want to achieve by selecting a specific topic for your note taking, for your discussions, for your report, and finally externalize it in your bra. What is your purpose? You need to stick to it. And you have to remember that purpose of the choice. And when I look through the number of information that you provide in terms of learning artifacts, I'm looking for clues of how you can manage to understand something from the topic of interest there based on the limited amount of time, okay? We do them all the time we want. Uh, the amount of resources you have used, the, how you enumerate the resources, how you extract the information from the resources, the collaborations with your learning partner, the discussions there, the evidence of the discussions on your forums, and a lot of you did not do it on your forum, okay? And, and that means you have not used the resources expected there through discussions. So, uh, I bring in this uh, seventh teacher's message to make sure that you understand the point here. Self-regulated learning as now arrow on top of inquiry-based learning is basically to see how mature or how comfortable you become in making the best use of this arrangement. As I said from the very beginning, when I teach calculus, I use a talk to learn approach. I have to make sure you finish homework. I have to make sure you come to the course, write all of this question. But in this course, it's a learn to learn approach. That means I would not question you during the process of your work, but I will look at what you did after a period of time and whether what you did is consistent with what we expect. And if not, I will remind you through the documents given in hotlines, where is the assessment record? So, basically, you have to ask yourself this question. Have I made the best use of this scheme to, say, do what I expect? For example, you can check on yourself. Um, if you say that I'm going to spend four hours a week and doing this class, particularly in meeting the learning artifact, have I kept records of how I make the best use of these four hours? Okay? Um, have I tried to stick to a pattern of resource usage such that I understand how best I can use the four hours, or if the four hours is good enough or not? And if you look at the recommendations at the very beginning of the course, I expect six hours per week. That means you have to use six hours to do note taking, reading, making decisions, discussions with your learning partner, writing your report, and then updating your blog. So if you can make the best use of six hours, only six hours per week, and learn to use the six hours to cover all of those activity, and you have, this is week number seven, okay? Now I say you start doing that in week number three, okay? We are stepping into week number seven. So from week number three, week number four, week number five, and week number six, including the holiday, how are you going to conclude your experience over the six weeks? Okay? And so you know that what you need to do, starting from week number seven, okay, after you submit all the artifact for second learning contract. And the most important thing is I as I re uh, remind you, it's individuals' path learning in this course will be quite different because it very much depends on which topic you use. Uh, in my calculus class, everybody is going to come to write the same question paper and so that I can understand how he managed to, to, to learn the skills of differentiations, interpretations, or whatever it is. But in this course, because each one of you, um, as far as each pair of you, could select a different topic. And even if you have selected the same topic under the reading list, as I said, it's really up to you how to come up with your topic sentence or key topics under this, and so you can have your own topics. And this is one way which very much demonstrates your freedom to choose and also the way you can manage yourself. So what I would like to see in your second learning contract in particular, in your third learning contract, it's more collaborations, more discussions, and when I read your report, I can see more of your thinking, okay? On why you choose this topic, and what difficulty have you encountered to pursue the answers to a particular topic. 
And what exactly is the answer you're looking for? Right? And also, I would like to re remind you that the resources built in this particular web is more than enough for you to use. For example, if you say that I am the kind of student who are used to the taught to learn model, have you actually come to the learn and practice resource link and make the best use of the teachers provided taught to learn resources? Okay? And if you've already done this, uh, I could see that your path of choice would be quite different from um, the other students. So the question is, um, have you become comfortable enough uh, at this point of your study to make the best use of the resources here to encompass some of your learning goals? Now, uh, I would say that the learning goals here will be very much the same in terms of coming up with the learning artifacts that is expected you in the first learning contract, the second learning contract, as well as the third learning contract. But the topics itself will be quite different, okay? So it's really up to you how to choose, okay? How to choose. All right, having said that, let me come back to week number seven, and you remember what we cover in week number six. We say that when you come back here, we're going to introduce to you another figure who's very, very famous in the context of social engineering. And so, here we go, in day number 13, all right? So we come back to the ideas of ethical issues of hacking and cracking, as well as information fraud. So the specific topic here is again social engineering. So we have already learned something about this in week number six. So today, we are going to concentrate on understanding a very interesting figure who happens to be called a a master in social engineering with the name Calvin the name. We're going back to 1990 to look at what this person has become, and then we're going to have uh, some discussions about this. Kevin Mitnick was probably the world's most notorious cyber thief when he was captured in 1995 and sentenced to five years in prison. Over a 13-year period, Mitnick broke into the computer systems of more than 35 major international corporations and other organizations, exploits that made him the FBI's most wanted computer criminal. When we first sat down with Mitnick in January of 2000, just before his release from federal prison, he told us that he saw himself not as a devious criminal, but more like a merry prankster. I saw myself as an electronic joyrider having a great time on the information superhighway. I felt like I was like James Bond behind the computer. It was a big game. I was just having a blast. Did it ever occur to you that perhaps what you were doing was wrong? Oh yeah, yeah. It was an, it was an invasion of privacy. You know, going going and getting access to other people's information is obviously a gross invasion of privacy in Israel. And that didn't bother me? Um, at the time I was doing it? Um, no. What Smitnick was doing was breaking through the highly sophisticated computer defense systems that companies use to protect their trade secrets, which he repeatedly stole. His list of victims reads like a who's who of big business. They include Motorola, Sun Microsystems, Nokia, and software maker Novems. All told, the companies estimate Mitnick cost them $300 million in damages. I believe I caused some damage, but nowhere near that number. I was a, an accomplished computer trespasser. I don't consider myself a thief. I didn't deprive these companies out of their software. I, I merely made a copy without doing anything more with it. You stole it. I copied it without permission. You did steal it. Stealing, Kevin. Stealing. I didn't use it for financial gain, nor did I cause any harm. Beyond his skills as a computer hacker, what also made Kevin Mitnick so effective, according to the FBI, was his phenomenal ability to obtain confidential information from corporations by phoning unsuspecting employees and simply asking them for it. It's known as social engineering. How would you describe social engineering? Well, basically lying on the phone, manipulating 
for conning information of people over the telephone. So you were a good company. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, I was successful. Mitnick was hacking and conning his way into corporate computer systems 10 to 12 hours a day. And while he held down legitimate jobs working with computers, he says hacking was like an addiction, which eventually became the most important thing in his life. At one point, Kevin, you got, you got married, right? Yeah, 1987. Didn't work? Well, uh, no. I mean, initially it was great. Uh, you know, I loved her very much. Uh, but, you know, what really broke up the marriage was I was too, you know, I, I kept going back to my hacking. So it became a higher priority. By the age of 25, Kevin Mitnick had been arrested three times for computer fraud. In 1989, he spent a year in jail. He was then placed on probation in order to receive counseling. He attended a 12-step program for his apparent addiction to hacking. It didn't work. He continued hacking. A warrant for his arrest was issued, and he became a fugitive, the FBI's most wanted cyber criminal. For more than two years, no law enforcement agency could catch him as he hacked his way across the country, assuming new identities. But eventually, the FBI was able to track him down. And in the middle of the night on February 15, 1995, a team of FBI agents knocked on Kevin Mitnick's door, where he was living under an assumed name. I think the guy goes, are you Kevin Mitnick? I go, no. I said, go look on the mailbox. You got the wrong apartment. And then he brings out this wanted poster, it's Kevin Mitnick, right? And he's like, he goes, well, isn't this you? And what am I going to say, yeah? <laughs> you know? I go, well, I said, the nose looks a little bit the same, but everything else is definitely not me. And I handed back the poster. He goes, well, tell you what we're going to do. We want to take you down to the FBI and fingerprint you and, um, and determine whether you're, you're Mitnick or anything. I said, great, what time do you want me to sharpen the morning? <laughs> <laughs> and they go, no, we, we want to take you now. <laughs> so the social engineering skills hit a brick wall, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, where's a good place to stand? <laughs> Soon after we spoke to him in January of 2000, Mitnick walked out of jail a free man after having served almost five years. But the government wasn't finished with him yet. We'll tell you more about that when our update continues. Tonight's update is sponsored by Zelnor. Ask your doctor about Zelnor. But we do not accept this. It's okay. Millions of women have tried fire. This is American suppressors. But they didn't go far enough to help all their symptoms. If you have recurring abdominal pain or discomfort, bloating, and constipation, you may have IBS with constipation. Fortunately, there's a proven medicine that works at the source of the problem to relieve all three symptoms. Prescription Zelmore. Unlike fiber and laxatives, only Zelmore helps coordinate the nerves, muscles, and fluid in your GI tract so it starts functioning more normally and you can start feeling better. Zelmore is only indicated for women. You should not take Zelmore if you have a history of diarrhea, kidney, liver, or gallbladder disease, intestinal blockage, or adhesions. If you get new or worse abdominal pain, blood and stool, bad diarrhea, or diarrhea with cramping, pain, or dizziness, stop taking Zelmore and tell your doctor. Ask your doctor about getting relief with Zelmore. Zelmore, be yourself again. As part of his probation, Kevin Mitnick's access to computers was severely restricted. His career prospects were uncertain. That is, until the federal government came looking for him once again. But this time, he had no reason to run because they wanted his help. My name is Kevin Mitnick. I appear before you today. I was released from custody January of 2000. And just a few months later, I was invited to testify before Congress. What you're telling us that, is that all our systems are vulnerable, both government and private. Absolutely. And after that, a lot of uh, businesses, I guess from seeing me on C-SPAN, were interested in having me speak about security. And so a new career was born. This is a video Mitnick uses to market himself to potential clients. A lot of you probably already know about my, uh, my past. I was uh, involved in computer hacking. The purpose of my public speaking is to raise awareness to what, what the security threats are, how the bad guys operate, and what you could do to protect yourself. There's the old adage, it takes a few to catch a thief. 
Mythic maintains he no longer does any illegal hacking, but that hasn't stopped him from playing a hacker on TV. We have Kelvin we still access to a bogus website, appearing on an episode of Aliens. And in real life, Mythic freely admits that he's still breaking into other people's computer systems. But these days, he insists it's by invitation only, and it's legal. I'm an ethical hacker today, and what I do is I essentially get paid to hack ethically to find security vulnerabilities in my client systems and notify them so they can fix them. No longer on probation, Mitnick is not only busy consulting and speaking, he's also written a book on computer security and is working on a set. So we think I've grown up. <laughs> It took a little while, but I finally did. Okay, now you have uh, heard the story of Kelvin Medek. So he became a very famous speaker in different conferences, including this one. Uh, we are not going to watch it now, but uh, we'll let you choose to watch it at the Kevin Medek. Okay, you can uh, just pause here. Now, I want you to put things into perspective for yourself, what we have been studying, why we saw you this story. Uh, look at this. I cannot expect all of you to become technical experts in the context of hacking. That's why we don't even invite you to a lab and give you virus software to do anything. But in this course, as a general education course, we want to enhance your understanding and what is meant by different kinds of information security issues. And in the context of this particular day, which we covered earlier, is social engineering. And in order to help you understand better the idea of social engineering, which we've already done it in before the Chinese New Year's holiday, today we introduce the story of this guy, Calvin Minnick. All right? So you know something about this guy, and you know it, um, it, it used to be a black hacker, OK? So, but now he began himself as a white hacker. Okay, so the issues of ethical hacking and cracking comes up, and what do you think, all right? So, uh, what do you think uh, if we have something similar to this person in China? Is it possible for him to become uh, uh, a famous person now. Now, well, inside China, would, would that be possible? He would have already been killed because of what he did before, right? He he, he broke into a government system, broke into a different kind of a company, and he was caught, put in jail. But now, in this very interesting story, he, he was released and he, he turned into a professional and even hired by the government to help defend the hacking attack by others. Now, I'll give you five minutes time so you can try to organize a little bit of your thinking and share that with your learning partner, and then we would like to listen to you, okay? So definitely there are many different things you can relate to uh, Calvin Minnick after his prison uh, terms uh, in, in the year 2000, and you can see this is as early as 2010, and the one you saw is as, as late as 2014. So he's doing a very good job in the 14 years after he was released from the prisons. Okay, so I give you some time to organize yourself, all right? And then we'll come to listen to you. All right, it's time for you to dig into the story. Just like watching a movie and you share with your living partner, all right? Lyson is not here today. Harvard is not here. Maybe you can talk with uh, Yoga, all right? Oh, by the way, the reporter that you see there uh, is Ed Bradley. He was, he's, he was dead. He's gone already, okay?
can help you to come up uh, with ideas and organize your idea, you need to first follow the path of the OIA. First of all, you have watched this movie, or better say video, and you got some impressions about the story. And the story was developed along the line of a figure by the name Kelvin Rene. But the reasons why we extended this story, now that is the IPOP interpretation, we need to relate the story to the themes of this week, ethical hacking and cracking. Now what is meant by ethical hacking and cracking, okay? Now, you do not need to know all about this, but you heard the story, and so you look for examples of this. Okay, any specific examples of African hackings, or cracking, or even non-African hacking, cracking, uh, discussed or enumerated in the video. And then, why do we need this story to help us to understand these issues? Okay, so it, it, it very much depends on where you're going to put your matrix there what you want to explore, okay? And so when you share, you can pinpoint on views which is related to your interest, okay? You do not need to tell the whole story. No one is going to ask you to tell the whole story, uh, and we do not do that. The question is, what is your concern, all right? The next thing we would like to talk about is information fraud, which is very much related to the same issues, okay? And, of course, if you have already visited, and unfortunately, in Macau, we do have a very interesting organization, which is called Acting. The Macau New Technologies Incubation Incubator Center. And under this organization, we have a team who is very good for Macau, called the Mozart. Now, in every country, or in every specific region, in Hong Kong, they have the Hong Kong, sir. In Singapore, they have a Singapore cert. In Macau, we do have a Macau cert. In Macau, we do the emergency response to them. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of big business in Macau yet. Um, this is very good because uh, just like when you need help, you call 911 or 999 in Macau, and uh, the, uh, the rescue team from the, um, the fire office will come there, will come down to your house with all the equipment and help you and send you to the hospital. And when your computer has some kind of problem, or when an organization has some kind of problem, they can call the center to see what they can call. Okay? Very interesting. I do not know if something like this will also exist inside the regions of China, and do they have definitely they have a lot of expertise in the hacking, but do will they set up a center like this to help the enterprises and government to respond? We still want um, the park on your participations, your sharing, okay? So that is very important. And do not forget that you can crane your sharing sport in every class, okay? But that is very important for you to earn the score. And we have uh, two months left, okay? Just don't waste the very good opportunity to earn your score. When you're ready, you can pick up the microphone and share. Thank you, Anna. Hello. Uh, judging from this video, uh, what I think is uh, that a man uh, who has a powerful ability has to uh, learn how to be more uh, moral and uh, have the, uh, let's say, uh, have the, uh, vertical integrating. Okay. And uh, uh, otherwise, if uh, he is, his ability is more powerful, he will hurt more people. Okay. Um, I heard this story which said uh, in this society, many people are hardworking, but they earn just a little amount of money. Okay? And they can't even afford 
to buy a house or to rent a house because they're very expensive. So someone said, let's pray the story of Robin Hood. You know, Robin Hood is a fictitious figure who's going to rob the wealthy and help the poor. You see what, what, what he means? Robin Hood is a hero in fictions. What he does is to rob, get money from the wealthy people, rob them. And to give the money, he rob to the poor. Okay, so many hacker, they might say that, oh, let's do Robin Hood. So, because we have the expertise of hacking, so we can actually hack into financial center or banks and trans this transfer money from the wealthy to the poor. Okay, we're doing a good job, but they're violating the law, right? That, that is, is this an example of ethical hacking? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Um, because if you don't uh, respect others' privacy, yeah. and uh, it means uh, others, uh, uh, it no need for others to respect you. And if you want others to respect you, uh, you have to respect others first. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Anna. Do you still remember the story of Captain Sam that we watched the last day before the Chinese New Year's holiday? What he did, and the very uh, of his age, is he he's changed the clock of a telecommunications company so that people used to pay very expensive fare in order to call long distance. Turns out to pay very little amount of money because he changed the clock of the company. And because the clock is the definitely the device used to determine which period people can enjoy very cheap rate and which period they have to pay high price, right? So in a sense, it's actually robbing the telephone company money because he's giving the money back to the poor. Now, he, he did not transfer money. He just changed the clock. So that everybody can, can call long distance with a small amount of price. How did the company find out only at the end of one month when they look at the bill, how come that we earn this little, all right? So people said, some of the students, my students said, in Macau, we pay a very high price to do intellect. We pay to CDM, right? So if we can somehow change the clock of CDM, everybody enjoy. But this is just a joke, okay? But is it ethical hacking? No, no, right? Okay, can you pass the microphone to Sammy? Sammy, what do you think? Uh, well, I think that uh, in the case of Kevin Nick, I think uh, he's a very talented uh, hacker. Yes. And I think such a talented man that uh, what really satisfies him is not about whether it's damaging the, uh, the system or helping the system, it's just hacking. Okay. It seems satisfied. Okay. I think just in my opinion. Okay. So whether uh, uh, actually there is another thing that the, the boundary line between a white and a black hacker. Yes. I think that line is very vague. Okay. And what what makes a hacker a ethical hacker or a cracker is just the moral codes. Okay. Yes, thank you, Sammy. Uh, Lancy, what do you think? Sammy and man mentions the moral codes. So, what do you think? Um, well, I think everyone who is good at um, technology faces two problems. Um, firstly, maybe the way he chooses to show his talent. Okay. And the second is. Um, what he will choose when he faces money and uh, his own morality. Um, morality, mor yes, yes. No, yes. no, 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 no Thank you. Balls, maybe. Um, I think uh, as for the first problem, um, maybe uh, I can give a good example. Yes. In the mainland China, uh, there are there is a very famous um, software. Uh, which can help, uh, which can help to protect our security uh, in computer. It is called uh, three six zero. 
very sexy. Yeah, okay. maybe maybe ah, uh, sensual. Okay. Um, Thank you. And it, it's both uh, originally is a black hacker. Okay. Uh, he focused to uh, he focused on uh, developing uh, some bad software okay. uh, to hurt our computer. Yes. Uh, but then he found his own direction and right. he developed uh, three uh, three six zero, uh, which is a free uh, a free software right. who can protect our computer okay. and it forces other uh, software where to uh, make their price down. Oh, okay. uh, And it, it is very good for us to use this okay. software because we can save our money. Yeah, because it's free of charge, right? Yes, okay. it's free of charge. So uh, he was originally a hacker, yeah. but later on he changed his directions. Yeah. Instead of hacking into someone else's computer causing damage, he create a software so everybody can use the software to protect their own computer. Yes. Okay. And then now 360 is the biggest software in the mainland China. That means he create his own company too. Yeah. Oh, that, 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 that means many stories like this. But is it being documented using some kind of YouTube video so that we can know who he is? Yeah, so I think um, the definition when, when we define whether this yeah. man is a black hacker Yes. or a white hacker. It's just uh, uh, depends on uh, which ways he choose. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, they all need a very good talent or technology, but he choose to protect most of the people's benefits. Okay. Uh, maybe not, not for money, maybe not for their own principle, um, but uh, most of the people support him then he become a black, a, a, a white, ha white hacker. White hacker. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing this story. Is there any link we can we, you can share with us so that we can read more about the story on three sixty? Uh, maybe you can share later. Thank you. Can you pass the microphone to say Billy and Edward? Hi, Billy. Or oh, Edward first. Thank you. Us. Uh, as last uh, as he said, mm, uh, I also think soft, uh, when download the software from the internet, uh, the uh, the software pro uh, will will check the computer. Yes. Uh, may hack some in the computer. Uh, um, not really, but I think that um, the then uh, if the uh, if the hacker to damage the computer, then it will be illegal. Um, uh, so uh, I think if uh, someone have uh, ability, then. Uh, uh, he should he should not assume his ability. Uh, F uh, and the all ability. Okay, so uh, your your point of view is very much related to the one shared by Lancy about the people with technology skills. Uh, is the way how they use the tenants, right? So if the way they use the tenant will cause harm to us uh, through the way they introduce in the software that, that he shares, okay? So that it's going to be uh, difficult because th that is not for common good, right? So um, for us, when we talk about information security and privacy here, we want to just be educated uh, about the impact of this kind of actions in our daily living. And of course we want to do the best to avoid things like this, so we need to follow some kind of um, state of the uh, art practices in using computer, like uh, we installed antivirus software in our computer to scan files to pr protect us from getting trapped into this kind of uh, 
acts, right? So what do you think, Billy? After Edward's comment, what do you think? How do you, how do you make sense of um, a story like this? Maybe I think in this case, um, maybe I saw something people is done the same thing in the real world and in my friend and someone yes. is like to do something hacking yes. but uh, I and I also think that is why you do that and is this something excited or something interest to know the others the information of others and also maybe they find something um, excitement or maybe another things okay so one of the uh, possible answers uh, which was given by Sammy earlier it's to understand why those people hacked uh, well, unethically, it could be attributed to the reasons that they will dis discover a lot of satisfactions through the act of hacking. They're addicted to doing it, and because the more they do it, they, they want to do more. So just it's a kind of a, um, a behavior that we need to study, not from the technical point of view just, but from also from the moral point of view or the social development or even the personal development point of view. Thank you, Billy. So you want to pass the microphone to Timmy and Gaius? Do you have anything to share with us, Timmy and Gaius? Uh, after I watch this movie, yes. I, I think um, no matter is a hacker or cracker, um, they are both using the uh, using the people information to right. get money and okay. because some of the hacker uh, doing some famous things so after he uh, uh, come back from the jail uh, he will become a cracker okay. so I think cracker is only a job that lets the hacker easily to get the job. Okay, but it's going to be a very circuitous path because uh, instead, no, what we are doing here is like what you because do here. Because if yes, a yes, hacker yes. is distant, famous, yes. the community or the country will not uh, pay money to yes. let them to do this job. Yes. Uh, I understand your like of thinking. Now, the, the issue is ethical hacking or cracking. Because uh, like a singer, once he becomes famous, people will recognize his yes. ability, so they are going to give him high, high salary or even high compensation. So uh, in a similar light of reasoning, when a person has this kind of skill, and he becomes famous in this field, even though he was jailed, at the end of his jail term, when he comes back, people still recognize that this guy could do it, right? So they, they pay respect to him and they hire him to do other things of work. Uh, but the question is, uh, this is not always the case, except for very few people could do it. Uh, when we go to be educated in college, we want to be uh, equipped with definite uh, knowledge and skills so that by the time we graduate from school, we have the skill and when we look for a job, they could recognize our skill because we have a degree, uh, we have been educated. Uh, but we are not as fa famous as those guys, right? So when we come back to the issues of Africa hacking, which path people would choose? Um, and I think the majority of people would not choose the path like this. But in the context of this, uh, the social environment, we increasingly see that the many hackers doing things uh, and uh, at the end of this, of their, at the end of the day, 
when they demonstrate a skew, looks like it works for them, right? So Calvin Minnick wrote a lot of books, and they, they, perhaps next when I bring some of his books to share with you, okay? Thank you, thank you guys. And uh, Stevie, you want to say something? Okay, then uh, angels and uh, thank you. Hi, you don't want to say something? Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a fan. Uh, right. He also interested in uh, this area. Okay. Uh, he told me that he also want to be a hacker. Okay. Or uh, want to hack once, hack something once. Okay. Because uh, he think that um, uh, be a hacker, uh, he must have a high Terrorist skill. Yes, so, yes. So that he he can be a hacker. Okay. Um, and he will think that um he can earn many money. All right. If, so yes. thank you very much. There's a lot of people who also share that kind of a mentality with it. Okay. Uh, allow me to say that um. This is very important. I just remember that. Now, you know that I have been inviting you to share your view at the end of watching some movie, right? So you better keep a record of your sharing because that will also be a record for you to use to earn your classroom participation score, okay? You do not, it's not just that you come up here and uh, ask for a time slot to share that you will earn. So, because this kind of discussion is actually classroom participation. So if you keep a record of things like this, you can use that in-class response as one record of classroom participation. And that will be very uh, interesting because it encourages you to do a lot of the sharing in class. And we have been doing that almost in every class. Okay, now let's say, uh, let's take a look at this picture. I think it's a very soft one, yes. But it's very useful. All right, Kevin, thanks for, uh, for coming to meet with me. It's good to meet you. Hi, great to be here. And uh, I wanted to start off, uh, so I, we were talking earlier about uh, what you are. You're a, you're a reformed computer hacker. Yeah, a former. A former computer hacker. Well, that's kind of half true. Um, back in days old, I used to be a bad guy hacker. In other words, breaking the systems without permission. Never to damage stuff or to steal money. It was all about the intellectual curiosity. Um, and now, I still do hacking, but in an ethical sense, a lot of corporations and government agencies from around the world hire me to test their security using the same exact techniques that I used many years ago. So the, the individuals who are going to be watching this video are digital nomads. So they're people that are traveling the world or traveling around a hotel like we're sitting right now. And I mean, you can look around here. There are people that are sitting with their laptops open. There's a network here that they can get on. Does that, would that concern you if there were a hacker in this area? Well, put it this way, at hacker conventions like Black Hat and DEF CON, I, I turn off everything. I, I bring a laptop like with a new build of the OS that has nothing on it. And uh, because there's always ways to attack, I mean, uh, attack systems. They can attack a vulnerability in the driver that drives your wireless card, for example, and gain access to your system, maybe uh, find some sophisticated malicious code. But when I look around the room and I see people on their laptops, especially with open wireless like they have at hotels, I just think, wow, there are a lot of targets. Right, because people aren't using encryption. Um, a lot of times, um, they're not aware of the sophisticated attacks. First of all, you can have a rogue access point. So when somebody thinks they're associating with a hotel, they're associating with a rogue access point. You could do cross-site request forgery. What that is, is let's say you're already authenticated to your bank or utility company or website. You've already signed in. Well, if the attacker uh, has identified a cross-site request forgery bug in any of the sites that you've authenticated to, if you're on a wireless network, the attacker could see the traffic and then basically pretend to be the, re the responding host if they go to Google and just inject JavaScript into your browser and it can, it can process a transaction on the websites you've already been authenticated to. And the real victim is in the logs, not even the attacker. 
So there's a lot of different old and new attacks that can happen over wireless. You can do man in the middle. Um, you can basically uh, hijack the entire wireless network depending on the router, the wireless router they're using, but a lot of hotels uh, don't protect against this type of attack, is where you're doing ARP poisoning. And you're basically telling everyone uh, or, the, or the, that you are the router. And all the connections are going through you. If you can create that environment, you can do man in the middle attacks, which mean when somebody goes to a site that uses SSL, um, secure sockets layer, um, Mind you, the, the victim will get like a certificate doesn't match warning, but everyone just clicks OK to continue anyway. And then if you're connected to your bank or a credit card company, then everything can be monitored in the middle by the attacker. And these are very simple. A 15-year-old with Backtrack 3, which is a bootable uh, penetration testing tool set, could do these type of attacks by sitting in a hotel, sitting at an airport. It's really easy. So for uh, the nomad, the person who's either on a plane flying around the world or going to the local coffee shop to work from there versus going to the office, what, what tips would you give them? Things that they well, could do to be, to be more secure. Can I digress for that question sure. for a second? Just because you're in an airplane, you're not safe. Because when you're in an airplane, what happens in, like, like for example, in Windows and even in the Mac OS, is as soon as you put up your computer, uh, the wireless zero configuration service on Windows is going down the list of access points that are on your preferred list, and they're basically checking, is that available, is that available, is that available, and they're going down the list of access points you associated to before. So the hacker on the plane could run a simple utility that when your machine asks for, like, Linksys or, you know, American Airlines Lounge, the attacker says, yes, I'm that access point, hands off the person an IP address, and now they're on a local network. Together. So now when that person fires up Outlook because they want to write, write emails on the plane so when they, go, when they hit the ground they could connect and all their emails are sent out, what happens is Outlook every 15 minutes tries to connect to the server and if they're using like POP3 or IMAP, not, not SBOB or SIMAP, but insecure protocols that transmit the passwords and declare, now you're, you've been owned or compromised. Okay. So just because you're on, you can be 30,000 feet up in the air and still get hacked. So what should that person do? Hmm. I mean, is, is there something you can do? Or, or and, and my other question would be, is there such a thing as a secure laptop? No, there's, well, you can have secure laptops, but nothing is going to, secure laptop, what I mean is like everything on there is encrypted. That's one thing I recommend is, uh, for people that travel like myself, I travel, through customs all the time, you know, internationally. I, 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 I'm in a hotel here in Austin. Somebody can go to my room and rip off my laptop, but I keep everything encrypted. Okay. Personally, you know, there's two utilities, one TrueCrypt and one by PGP called uh, PGP Whole Disk Encryption. And these are uh, tools that people can use to encrypt their data. So that way, if laptops are stolen uh, and the data can't be decrypted, hopefully they're not using a very weak, easy to guess password, then the data is relatively safe. So I really recommend encryption. For wireless networks, um, I, I, I think you can configure, you can basically configure Windows to basically not automatically connect or probe for access points to connect to, or you can maybe configure it that it only will connect to secure, you know, once it uses web or WPA. Um, or you simply just turn off when you're on a plane. The easiest thing is to just turn, uh, disable the wireless interface. It takes a couple clicks. Um, I'd be very cautious about using open wireless networks. The first thing I would do is what I do myself is I set up a VPN to a server at home. So when, the first thing I do is connect via a virtual private network to, a, uh, to another system, and then all my traffic is tunneled through this encrypted tunnel. Okay. It doesn't give me 100% security, but it boosts uh, probably 80% and the attackers are going to go after the low-hanging fruit. Unless they knew it was Kevin Mitnick, then they try to work a little bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let me turn off the computer first. This is another very interesting one. This is a very good one. Three of the time time. Maybe I can get to you later. Okay, let me ask you this uh, very interesting question. You all use wireless network in the campus. 
So, uh, which particular uh, network did you use? Did you choose secure, or did you just use uh, the normal one? Did you remember? No? Okay, another question. You check it next time when you press um, um, your wireless uh, devices. Another question is, would you are working outside of the University of Health Campus and you want to connect it back, um, do you know that you can connect it through the VPN to the University of Health Which is just mentioned here, it's the safest way to do it. It's not a, it's not a, a, a secure enough way, but it's already 80% high that what people can do. So this is the two things that you need to remember. Uh, if you are an outsider to the University of Health Campus, Use the virus network here. There are several specific networks here that are huge. Uh, but for us staff and for students, we is recommended by the ICQ people to use a secure virus network. Now, that is what you mentioned. Do not use those that are not protected. That means the encryption standard is not good, it's weak. And if we work outside the campus, we want to connect back, for example, get access to the university libraries material, we connect through the VPN. All right? So, um, I think it's just a very casual conversation, but I still do a lot of things to learn from this. So, now, I think I'm going to end it here today. Uh, let me take attendance for today. And on Thursday, we come to the context of information from. I will give you a very interesting example of that. We have been using real life example simple enough for you to understand the story, and that you need to dig into it by looking into the latest sources which are already available in okay. this game. All right, let me uh, create a tenants for the first one. more advice before I forget. Uh, for those of you who know that uh, you have to submit the learning artifact or learning contract number two um, before the end of this week, make sure you submit something. Uh, if you do not submit anything, the chances is you definitely cannot earn any grade. Now, even if you have not finished all the work, submit something. Make sure you develop this habit. Otherwise, you are not going to earn something important for your score in the semester, okay? Uh, Angel is here, uh, John C is not here, Harvard is not here, Andy is here, right? And then Anna is here. Uh, Annie, yes, Billy, Gaius, okay? And then Timmy, yes, Wyson is not here today. Uh, Sammy is here, Lancy is here, Sophie, thank you. Uh, and then Edward is here, thank you very much, all right? Make sure you submit something, all right? And although the percentage of the free learning contract is not high, 10% of the final semester or per contract, you still have to make sure you do not give up on submit something. Even though your learning path has not been cooperating enough, you can do something, okay? Individual, the submission rate is for individual to submit. So submit your part of that something, which Earn your grade, all right? Don't give up, all right? So thank you very much for coming today. The very first day after Chinese New Year's holiday, we'll meet you again on the first day, okay? So that's it for today, CIS 213, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy, on March the 2nd, 2015.